part two of the um, famous theorist in historical sociology. So the next two theorists, Marx and Weber, are very important in understanding the development of sociology. And they come at it from two very different angles. Let's start out with Karl Marx. Karl Marx argued that society is driven by this constant competition over scarce resources. That there's this whole pie out there and everybody wants a piece of the pie, but there's not enough pie for everyone to have the pie. And so he talked a lot about the, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. Another way to think of that is the haves and the have-nots. Um, although the technical definition here, the bourgeoisie are the owners of the means of production. They're the business owners, the people who in a capitalist system have the power and the, the ownership. The proletariat are the workers. They work for the bourgeoisie. They work for the owners of the means of production. Um, so for Marx, this idea is that, you know, there's this constant competition and that leads to inequality and he also felt that it was very important that we challenge that inequality that inequality should not be a big part of our society that that we should all sort of um, get a fair fairly even shot at things and he felt that the bourgeoisie were exploiting the proletariat in all of this um, and that kind of puts him in contrast with Weber it's not Weber, by the way, it's Weber. So if Marx says, hey, we need to try to change things as sociologists, we shouldn't just sit back and observe these inequalities that are bad for society, we should do something, that was in direct contrast with Weber. And Weber felt that the role of the sociologist was to be value neutral or value free, and that they shouldn't be bringing their values into the discussion. They shouldn't be trying to work for change, but instead they should be trying to describe just what's going on in a completely objective, neutral manner. So it's very important for Weber that the sociologist be unbiased. What I find interesting is that this is still a debate in sociology today. Should we as sociologists and as researchers be activists advocating for change, or should we as sociologists and as researchers be um, unbiased, neutral observers. We can talk about the advantages and disadvantages of each of those. I think that's a very important debate and discussion for us to have um, with each other. Weber also talked a lot about the Protestant ethic. He felt that the Protestant ethic is what led to the development of capitalism. And he felt that it was this ideology of sort of trying to save things, to show your favor with God, that you had more money. It was a sign that God was smiling upon you. If you your neighbor had one axe, but you had five. God must be viewing you favorably. That's the Protestant ethic. Some of that is even alive today. You'll see people buy a house or buy a car or something, and people will say, oh, you're so blessed. God is blessing you, as if these, these material signs of wealth are signs of favorability with God. That's the Protestant ethic, and that's where that comes from. Um, Weber also disagreed with Marx. You can see they, they go back and forth. They like to argue with each other. Um, in terms of how you measure class, Marx felt that there were two classes, the bourgeoisie, the proletariat, the owners of the means of production, the people who work for them. And Weber comes along and he says, no, I think it's more complicated than that. I think we really need to look at three things, prestige, power, and property. How much respect do you get? How much property do you own? How much power and influence do you have? And in particular, he was interested in what he saw as the power of religious leaders of the time. So we're going back hundreds of years here. And if you go back to the late 1700s, early to mid 1800s, you'll see religious leaders have a lot of power, but they're not the bourgeoisie and they're not the proletariat. They don't own the businesses, they don't work for the businesses. And so this is Weber's way of saying, hey, Marx, did you consider this other factor? You didn't consider people who might not be owners, but still have a lot of power. He also came up with the idea of bureaucracy. Bureaucracy is how large scale groups and organizations, businesses, um, this is how they run. They have sort of separate divisions of labor, different departments, a chain of command. I'm not going to go through all the seven characteristics of bureaucracy, but this is where this idea comes from. 
the last two theorists are different from the others. Uh, Mead and Cooley are different in three ways. Number one, they're Americans. Number two, they're social psychologists. And number three, their time frame is a lot later. A lot of people don't even talk about them in the first chapter. In fact, I don't think your book really does either. Um, a lot of people talk about them in chapters, well, usually like three, four, five. These are the chapters that are on social psychology and human development. And this is this perspective in sociology starts in the U.S. And again, it's the early to mid 1900s where you see Mead and Cooley becoming more prominent. So Mead has this idea of the I and me theory. The I is the selfish part of the self, the unsocialized part of the self, the part of the self that wants whatever you want, whenever you want it. And the me is the more social, socialized side of you. So for example, when you're really young, the I is much more dominant, right? Little children, two, three years old, they want whatever they want when they want it. They can't wait, they don't like to wait, and they throw a fit and they might be on the floor ah, screaming and having a tantrum because they didn't get their way. Whereas when you get more socialized and you move towards the me, you start to be able to reflect on how your behavior looks to others and how you how others might respond to you if you do certain things and what the social norms are that you might be breaking. That's why the me is more socialized. Hopefully, as we get older, we all have a more, more dominant me, right, than, a, than the I. I think that's very important. Um, the preparatory stage, the play stage, and the game stage are stages of development that me came up with. In the preparatory stage, you're just copying what you see. You don't know why you're copying it. Your mom's brushing your hair, and you're going like that, too. You don't know why you're doing it. You're just repeating what you see the people around you doing. That's why as a parent, you have to be very careful about what you do when your kids are that age. You shouldn't be saying the F word because your two-year-old might be out in public and shout out the F word. Believe me, I've, I've been there with that kind of thing. Um, in the play stage, the child learns their own role, but they don't yet understand the role of others. So in the play stage, what you're doing is you're trying to um, do what you're supposed to do. So mommy says, time for dinner, little Timmy. And he climbs up on his seat and he sits there and he waits for his dinner because he knows that's his role, right? But in the game stage, you know not only your role, but the role of other people. And in order for you to play a game, it kind of helps to do that, right? So for example, me use example of baseball. If you want to play a baseball game, even if you're the pitcher, you still have to know what the first baseman does. You still have to know what the catcher does. You need to understand your own role as well as the role of others. And that is when you enter the game stage. Hopefully at this point in your life, you are all in the game stage. You know, you come into class when we go back face to face and the students come in and they sit in the, in the chairs. Nobody goes up to the teacher's desk or anything like that because they understand the role of the student as well as the role of the teacher, right? That's because we've entered the game stage. Generalized and significant others are terms that are often used totally improperly, by the way. So people say a significant other is like their boyfriend or their girlfriend. Well, that's not a totally wrong usage of it. But a generalized other is a particular role in this world. A mother, a teacher, a doctor, a president. Those are examples of generalized other roles. A significant other is a particular person playing one of those roles. So, for example, the role of a mother is a generalized other. But my mom is my significant other. That's a particular person known to me in my life playing that role of a mother. So is your particular boyfriend or girlfriend your significant other? Yes, they are. But guess what? I'm also your significant other. I'm playing the role of teacher. I am your teacher. If you're taking my class, I am your significant other. I'm a particular person in your life fulfilling the role of teacher. Cooley comes up with this idea called the looking glass self. The looking glass self argues that we get our sense of who we are based on others' reactions to us. And it's not just what those others think but our perception of what they think that matters. So if we think that other people think we're ugly or smart or beautiful, we will come to think that about ourselves. So if you think about this term, a looking glass, it's just an old school term for a mirror. 
So the idea is that people around us are our mirror on ourselves. They teach us who we are. They give us a way to think about ourselves. And so if we get a lot of compliments, we may start to think positive things. If we get a lot of negative feedback, we may start to think about negative things. You should think about examples in, in your own life where maybe your view of yourself changed based on what we call these reflected appraisals. That's the term for that from other people or where someone told you something about you and it affected how you saw yourself. That's the, the looking glass self. And this is going to come up more than once in this class because we use this to talk about um, several different things. Um, and the last point I want to make and I, I'm contributing partly to this problem myself by not giving it more time, is that there are a lot of contributions made by white women and men and women of color that were minimized. Because at this point in the history and development of sociology, there was a lot of uh, racism and sexism. People weren't really allowed in the academy if you were a person of color, if you were a woman. And Du Bois is important because he's the first African-American to get a PhD, and he gets a PhD in the social sciences, and he makes some very important contributions in the early 1900s to the development of sociology, but still he was very much marginalized because of his race. You see certain uh, women scholars who did a lot of sociological work, but they did it outside of the academy. And so that's very important for us to understand with people like Adams and Martineau, Fannie Lou Hamer, those are other examples of women who really, I would argue, contributed to the development of sociology. They just contributed in ways that, that were outside of the academy because that they were not allowed in those kinds of positions at that time. So these two slides or these two videos together should give you a sense of some of the major theorists and the history of and development of sociology.